So normally I use Zathura as my PDF reader, and it's a great application, but it's also not the only great PDF reader out there, and today we're looking at another one. This one is called Seoyak. Now, this is kind of a weird PDF reader because it's not just made to be a general PDF reader. It is obviously great at that, but its focus is to be good at working with research papers. So there's a couple of extra features there, which I think would actually be really useful back when I was at uni trying to like dig through papers and try to find references and stuff like that. I kind of wish I had this application. Now, all of the general stuff you'd expect to be in a PDF reader, especially a PDF reader on this channel, is going to be here. So we can scroll up and down by using the mouse. We can go and highlight something. Sadly, there isn't Vim key movement, but we can go and scroll up and down by using the arrow keys. And if you want it to be on J and K, then you could just go and rebind those. We can go to the first page by pressing GG. We can go to the last page by pressing capital G. I don't know why that doesn't go to the bottom of the last page but it just takes you directly to the last one. If you want to jump to a specific page, that can be done by pressing number of that page. So let's say we want to go to page two and then GG. And you can search for stuff by doing either control F or by doing slash. So if I want to search for something like the, and then we can go and cycle through those by pressing N or we can cycle in the other direction by pressing shift N. But all of that stuff is what you generally expect to be there. So what actually makes this focused around research papers. So one of the features is if we go and highlight something, let's say this right here, and then I go and press double S, that is actually gonna open up a browser window and search for that highlighted text inside of Google Scholar. And amusingly, it brings up something about the X window system, which wasn't actually planned, but it is certainly a nice coincidence. Now, if you don't like Google Scholar and instead would rather search on something like Libgen, that can be done as well. That is done by pressing SL and give that a second. Now, Libgen is going to take a while to load, but you can also change which mirror of Libgen it is going to open up if, if whatever one you're connecting to is taking too long to load or simply just doesn't load whatsoever. So in this case, we have a bunch of different research papers. No idea what any of these actually are, though. Ignore the fact that my video looks very different. I may have made a mistake when I recorded this a couple of weeks ago. So there's actually a couple of really interesting actions on the middle mouse click. I don't see middle mouse getting used that often, but in this case, it's used in a pretty cool way. So if we see, let's say, a figure number, if we go and middle mouse click on the figure number, it's going to jump us directly to that figure. The middle mouse click also provides another way to go and search for something inside of Google Scholar or Libgen. So if I go and middle mouse click on this right here, it's actually going to go and open up my browser and search for that text inside of Google Scholar. If I go and shift middle click, it's going to do the exact same thing, but this time over on Libgen. The way it breaks up the text is very dependent on how the document is actually written. So as you may have seen there, it included John Wiley's name as well as this comma here. That's just how these references are done. If they're done in a way where those elements are not included in the same group as this, then it won't include those. Now, if we want to open up a new PDF, that can be done in a couple of different ways. Obviously, we could go and run it from the terminal and pass in the file name, or we could like run it from a file browser and open up a specific file, but we can actually open up a new file from directly inside of the application. So if we want to do that, if we press O, that will bring up a file browser where I can go and find exactly what I want to go and open up. But the other thing we can do is if we had a PDF or an EPUB opened up earlier, if we press Shift O, that brings up a list of everything we've previously opened. So let's go and open up thesis.pdf, which is a random paper that I went and downloaded from, I don't know, some website out there. I didn't mention this early, but we can go and zoom in and out by using the minus key to zoom out and then the plus key to zoom in. Now, normally in this configuration, pressing equals is going to set the scaling back to 100%. It doesn't do that here. Instead, it just acts exactly the same way as minus. I don't know if that's a bug, but that's how it works. Also, if we hold down control and we scroll with our mouse wheel, that will also let us zoom as well. I always like it when that feature is an option there. Sometimes I have my hand on my mouse and it is just easier to do it like that. 
Now let's talk about marks and bookmarks, which sound very similar, and during my initial testing, I couldn't work out why they both existed, but there actually is a really good reason for them, and that is just to basically give the user some choice. So a mark is going to let you mark a location in the document, and that is going to be bound to a key. So let's say I want to mark, I don't know, this spot right here. So if I go and press M, and then press some other symbol after that, so let's say T. So that location is now going to be marked. If we scroll somewhere else in the document, and I go and press back tick, and then T again, that is going to jump us directly to that location. And from what I can tell, there isn't a limit for how many of these you can actually have. So, as for bookmarks, they produce basically the exact same result, but the way they work is slightly different. So let's go somewhere else in the document, let's say this point right here. So if we go and press B, that is going to prompt us to actually add a name for the bookmark. Let's just call this one, I don't know, uh, treatment for example. So if we go somewhere else in the document, that has now been added, but if we go somewhere else and now we press GB, so go bookmark, that is going to bring up a list of all of the bookmarks we currently have. So we can go and arrow key down to those, or we can start typing something and filter things out of the list. So let's start typing in treatment, and as we can see, it's the only thing left in the list. Pressing enter on that is then going to jump us directly to that point. Now that is just going to be the bookmarks from this current document, but if we go and press G capital B, that is going to bring up a list of every single bookmark we've currently set across all of our documents. So it might make sense to go and indicate which document a bookmark actually is in. I don't know how you'd go about doing that, maybe numbering it or indicating the name or something like that. This will actually make it much easier to work out where you're going to be jumping to. So I went and set a bookmark over in the tutorial document. And if we go and select that, now it's actually changed us over to that document. If you want to delete a bookmark, that can be done by pressing DB. And that is going to delete the bookmark closest to your current location. So DB. And if we go back into the bookmark list, that bookmark is no longer there. But all of the other bookmarks we have in the other document are still preserved. So marks give you a shorter hand way of jumping directly to a point, but it's much harder to remember which marks actually refer to which locations. Also, I don't believe there is currently a way to have marks go across multiple documents. Whereas for bookmarks, they take longer to write out, but they're much more descriptive of where they're going to go. Plus, as I said before, you can jump between different documents. So for doing a big research project, that might actually be incredibly useful. For those weird people out there who like to invert PDF files, that is also an option here by pressing F8. Usually I do like dark modes, like that's a thing I'll usually go for if it is an option. But I like dark modes that are specifically made for that thing, not just we're going to invert the document and that's going to break any images inside of the document. I totally get why some people like it, but it's not for me. In its current state, I feel like COYEC is already fairly useful, but there's a couple of extra really cool features that don't actually work. So, COYEC only recently got a Linux build, and when you release a build for a new operating system, generally there's going to be some hiccups here and there. So, what you're supposed to be able to do is press the T key, and that brings up a table of contents. This document does have a table of contents in it, so there's no reason why that shouldn't be working, but no matter what I try, it isn't actually working. And even if that doesn't work, there's supposed to be a command called go to underscore TOC that takes you to the table of contents. But even that command isn't actually working. So I didn't mention this before, but every single key binding is mapped to a command inside of the application. You can go into command mode the same way you do in Vim by pressing the colon key. Now, if you go and press F12, there's also this helper window, which... I guess the way this is supposed to work is as you scroll down the page, sometimes the figure that you're looking at in the paragraph you're on is not going to be visible. So this second window should be showing you that figure. And then when you scroll to the next page or when you scroll to the next figure reference, it'll show you that next figure. This window is just forever linking and I don't know how to fix that. I think this is one of those other problems which doesn't seem to be currently working 
inside the Linux build. I've tried this with other documents and I haven't had any luck getting this to work. Now, I haven't tried the Windows version, but judging by what you see on the COYEC website, this seems like it was tested over on the Windows version where all of these features actually are working as they should be. So as you can see, as you scroll down the page, it's going to go to the next figure and then the next figure, so on and so forth. Once again, that would be a really cool feature. All of these features that currently aren't working, I think would be very, very useful. And I really want to see them actually working on the Linux build. If they do start working, I might have to just switch this application. I know Zathura has a lot of other really cool things you can do, but I don't use most of them. This does everything I would want. Now, if you still like COYEC in its current state and you want to go and configure it, there is four config files. We have keys, keys user, prefs, and prefs user. Basically, keys and prefs, those are going to be the global configuration, and then the user variants are going to be the ones you actually want to modify. The documentation, though, doesn't tell you where these are located. Luckily, though, there are commands inside of the application to actually open these up. So if we go and run keys, that is going to open up the global keys configuration. You'll want to copy this over to the keys underscore user, which is going to be located in possibly the dumbest location you will ever see. So this is in dot config. I'm actually going to show you this. So this is in dot config dot local share coyak, not get rid of all of this and just put the coyak folder directly in the config. No, it creates its own dot local and share. I think you understand the concept of Linux configuration files, but you got it lost in translation somewhere. So keys user.config is going to be where you configure your keys. The way this is done is fairly simple. Basically the name of the command, and then after that, what key you want it to be bound to. And there is actually documentation inside of the config file, and I always like to see this. This is always nice to have there for new users. So you can rebind basically anything you want in the application to pretty much anything you want it to be. Now, as for the other file, that is going to be things like, hey, what do you want the background color to be? What do you want the highlight color to be? How much do you want the scrolling to move? How much do you want to zoom by? All of this general basic stuff. And can I just say, this is the greatest variable name I have ever seen. It is 39 characters long, but it does its job. It explains exactly what it's going to do. So I really hope to see the problems with the Linux build actually get ironed out because I think this is a really cool application. And if you don't want to be using Zathura where if you want to do a lot of this stuff, you probably will have to go and configure it yourself, or in some cases, you might not actually be able to do it. This, I think, is a pretty good choice for a middle ground between the really heavy PDF readers and extreme minimalism. If you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, please go check out my Patreon subscribe star Lee Berapay, linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or so YouTube shorts, and this channel is also available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out. <laughs>